Okay, Ling441, uh, we're starting to get into the home stretch here of the semester. Uh, and today, after talking about uh, vocal tract musculature in the previous um, lecture, I'm going to talk about audition or how we hear things. So, uh, the lectures I've been making recently have been sort of on the long side, uh, an hour or so. Uh, and I think it might be helpful if I start breaking them up a little bit uh, into smaller pieces. So, I'm going to try to do that with this lecture. Uh, it'll probably be broken down into four separate shots, uh, as it were. So, um, the first part of this, I'm basically going to describe to you the sort of the mechanical structures involved in the um, hearing system in human beings. So, without any further ado, let's get into it. How do we hear? Um, so the ear is the organ of hearing. It converts sound waves into electrical signals in the brain. And if you want to talk about this in technical jargon, you can say that this is the process of audition or just hearing in general, right? Uh, the main point I want to get across with this slide though is the idea of conversion of sound waves into different forms, ultimately into the electrical signals that we process neurologically through some mysterious system that we don't entirely understand yet. Uh, but before we get there, the sound waves have to go through three different parts of the ear. So the first part that it encounters is called the outer ear, where sound is represented acoustically in the air, sort of as we normally think about it. Uh, but then it goes to the middle ear, where it's represented mechanically in the form of waves in solid bones, which are very small bones, but they're still bones. Um, so we're not just moving air molecules around anymore. We're moving actual um, solid molecules around, I guess you could say. Uh, and then lastly, the sounds are converted into the um, inner ear, or they reach the inner ear where they're represented in the form of a liquid briefly before they um, uh, get converted finally into electrical signals that are connected to uh, the liquid in a very interesting way in your what's called your cochlea in the inner ear. Um, so I'm going to walk through this process in each of these three steps as we go, starting from the outside in. The outside or outer ear is what we normally think of as the ear. Uh, it's this structure here, but it also includes the auditory meatus or the ear canal, which dead ends in the eardrum or tympanic membrane. Uh, so all of this is where sound can be represented in acoustic form because it can travel in sound waves into your ear canal. Uh, and then the middle ear is where we see these tiny little bones, which uh, provide connections in between the eardrum here and the cochlea here, which is the snail shell shaped structure. That's not easy to say three times fast, but I said it once correctly, so I'm not going to say it again. Uh, but this is the inner ear, um, which is primarily um, we uh, the primary organ of the inner ear, you could say, is the cochlea, which connects to the auditory nerve, uh, where sound keeps traveling in the form of neurochemical signals to the auditory cortex in the brain. Um, yeah, so there are three little bones here that I mentioned before in the middle ear, and these are called ossicles, which basically just means little bones. Um, there's some other interesting structures in here as well. I'll point out there is this uh, sort of canal called the eustachian tube, which connects the middle ear basically with your nasopharynx. Uh, so there's actually um, a kind of port which opens and closes this, uh, but allows uh, there to be a connection between um, your nose and the ear itself. So uh, for actually, I don't know exactly why this might exist, but it helps to um, sort of balance air pressure if there is a sort of change in air pressure like when you go up into a plane uh, and you get that funny feeling in your ears. When you yawn, it may open up this port and therefore allow sort of the differential in air pressure to kind of equalize across this passageway, uh, which is why that's one trick to get that sort of painful sensation in your ear to stop um, when you go travel wherever. Uh, I'm getting a little bit far afield here already though, so let's get back to the basics. Um, so the outer ear, uh, this part here, kind of cut off the uh, labeling here, but this is technically known as the pinna or auricle. Um, so that part of your ear is what we normally think of as just the ear, um, but this is actually not even that functional in terms of uh, hearing. It's a bit more receptive to sounds from the front of your body than to sounds from the back. As you see, it kind of has like a bit of like a shell shape indentation on it, which might catch 
Um, sound waves a little bit better towards the front than from back here where it hits up against the sort of backing of it. Uh, but as it says here, uh, it functions primarily as an earring holder. Um, so if you've put that to that use, then congratulations, because otherwise it's not doing a whole lot. Um, once sound goes into your ear canals, or what are technically known as the auditory meatus, um, that they can travel down this canal, uh, which is still considered the outer ear, even though it's um, basically in your skull for about two to two and a half centimeters, uh, or that's about an inch total in length. Um, so that's a fair amount of length. Um, I'm gonna dig up something here for uh, comparison's sake, but I'll mention here that this is an open tube, or it's a tube that's open at one end, and therefore it will function as a resonator in the same way that the other tubes that are open at one end uh, we've seen before. So this is about an inch long, depending on the specifics of the person you're dealing with, but a tube, an open tube of length two and a half centimeters should resonate between about 3,500 3, or 4,000 hertz. Um, which interestingly, if you remember, is uh, about the frequency value of the singer's formant from a few lectures ago. So that may be another sort of, I guess you could say synergy, uh, where um, the singer's formant matches up with uh, well with sounds that resonate well in our ear canal. Uh, and therefore those sounds of that frequency will be uh, particularly easy to hear or they'll sound particularly loud to us. Uh, and I guess it's kind of just convenient that we can produce those uh, or figured out how to produce those even without knowing the exact science behind how it all works. Um, but that's kind of the story of humanity, isn't it? Um, anyways, there is another structure here on the outside of your ear canal called, well, I don't know, I guess I think of this as like an ear flap or something like that. I don't think that's a technical term. The technical term is the tragus, um, and that can um, provide loudness protection in case you're hearing something that's super loud. Um, I'll say as an aside, I haven't seen my daughter or my wife in four months at this point, but <laughs> so I get these little stories from Ukraine where they're hiding out right now. Uh, and there's some, so my daughter is 21 months old as of today, and she likes to watch cartoons on YouTube a lot. Um, it's her favorite thing. But there's apparently some cartoon she watches, like a Ukrainian cartoon on TV every once in a while. And uh, she's seen the episodes more than once. And there's some uh, part of the series that has a song they play in Ukrainian. And my daughter, 21 months old, like when she hears the song, she like sticks her fingers in her ear like that because she does not want to hear it, apparently. So. This can not only protect you from loudness protection, but also bad music, potentially. And again, you don't need to know the science to be able to stick your fingers in your ear and make it work for you. Okay, so as I said, the outer ear dead ends of the eardrum or tympanic membrane. Um, so the, uh, the eardrum is about um, the same area as the uh, eraser at the end of a pencil. Uh, and like I said, it's your uh, ear canal is about an inch long, so your ear canal will be maybe like that in length. So, uh, you know, you might, not recommending this, but people have a tendency to kind of dig wax out of their ear um, canal. Uh, so I don't know how far you get into your ear canal when you do that, but I doubt that you get an inch in like that, and you might be surprised that it goes that far into your head. Um, but that's how it works, right? And again, I'll say this too, uh, a tube of about this length will resonate at about 3,500 hertz or so. Yeah. Okay, um, so here's our eardrum. And like I said, this is, uh, well, it's not the scale. It's the area of about the end, uh, the eraser at the end of a pencil. And that sort of eraser, as it were, uh, is connected to these three bones in your middle ear. So this is, uh, I guess I'll mention before I move on, that this is a membrane, um, so it's kind of a thin skin-like structure in your body, and it can just basically vibrate back and forth in response to the acoustic sound waves coming in through the ear, can ear canal here. Uh, so it's so thin that it's able to respond um, to those pressure variations in the sound waves. Um, there are cases where you can get hearing loss, where you can basically rupture your eardrum if you hear a super loud sound, like an explosion. Uh, say if you're in a military situation and some dynamite blows up right next to you or something like that, a bomb or what have you, you can uh, rupture your eardrum and then that will kind of make this system basically break down. Um, 
to at least some extent uh, and you lose hearing in that ear. It is my understanding that the eardrums can heal themselves over time even if that occurs. Uh, I think without surgery, I don't want to go too far afield with my hypotheses here, but um, this is a fragile structure, I guess is the main point of that. Uh, and it has to be fragile in order to respond to the sorts of sound pressure variations that we're used to hearing. Um, for most of human history, we didn't have bombs. Uh, and instead, we're sort of sensitized to be able to hear very soft sounds, like in the forest or whatever, if we're out hunting for food and we need to know if there's like an animal out there or something. Um, so be that as it may, uh, this structure is sensitive to very quiet sounds as well as very loud sounds. There's a wide range of hearing that we have, but the system here uh, kind of winds up having the function of being able to amplify those um, mechanical vibrations in the eardrum to uh, before they get transmitted into the cochlea here. Um, so it does this in a uh, really interesting way with kind of a multi-step process as it goes from uh, the first bone which is called uh, colloquially the hammer or the malleus um, and it doesn't really super look like a hammer um, but you can kind of imagine that it's a hammer because what it does is it moves back and forth this way so the bottom part will vibrate back and forth like this and this part will vibrate back and forth like this and kind of hammer on this structure which well, quite frankly, it looks like an old-fashioned ear horn where it has this big round section here and then it um, kind of gets converted into a very small portion here. Uh, and this is called the anvil, um, colloquially again. Uh, its official name is the incus, but it has this broad flat part that the hammer can hammer on and then the whole thing kind of will rock back and forth in response to those vibrations. Um, and then through this connection here, um, it converts those uh, vibrations to the stirrup or what is technically known as the stapes. And so hopefully you can see this. Uh, this looks like an anvil, like an old fashioned, you know, blacksmith's anvil that it can sort of hammer uh, things flat on. The stirrup, uh, since we're in Calgary, unfortunately we missed Stampede this year, but I'm sure you've seen stirrups before if you've been to Stampede. Uh, and so this looks like what you put your foot in when you're, you know, riding on a horse, more or less, right? This is not, the putting your foot in this is obviously not the function of this particular structure in your body. Instead, it just kind of pushes or vibrates back and forth in this uh, direction uh, where there is sort of um, electrically charged fluid inside the cochlea and it's gonna push that fluid around as a result of these vibrations coming in through the eardrum. So uh, that's pretty cool. Like I said, these are the smallest bones in your body. Um, and somehow they evolved for this purpose. And you can kind of see that um, the eardrum is vibrating back and forth here, kind of on this plane, and the stirrup is more or less on the same level, uh, pushing back and forth in response to these vibrations, but after they've been amplified by this, these two connections that lead to it. So, um, like I said, those bones are known as the ossicles, and they function primarily as an amplifier for the sound waves coming into your outer ear. They increase sound pressure by about 20 to 25 decibels. So um, isn't that amazing? The way they work is that they focus sound vibrations into a smaller area. We saw that first of all with the incus or the anvil. So it starts off with this big area uh, vibrating here and then it kind of gets converted to this very small area at the end of the incus. Um, and so the area of the eardrum is more or less, uh, well, I don't want to say it's the same area as the incus that actually it's already smaller, but this area is about 0.55 squared centimeters. The area at the end of the stapes or the stirrup is much smaller than that. It's called the foot plate of the stapes. It's 0.032 squared centimeters. Um, so that's a kind of a large ratio right there to begin with. You can kind of think of this working as um, in the same way that a thumbtack works. Uh, so I'll give you a graphical example. Let's say you had a cylinder um, and you had kind of one of those old fashioned pegboards that you wanted to sort of stick a picture up on or something like that. Uh, if you tried to use a cylinder, like say an unsharpened pencil to try to push that thing in, you really wouldn't get anywhere. You'd probably just kind of like make an indentation in the picture maybe. Um, the way you can actually get that to work is 
not by having a cylinder do the work for you, but to have a thumbtack shaped structure, where, which has a large area on one side and then a very tiny area on the other, which can kind of pierce through the picture and the pegboard as well. Um, so the pressure on any given area is force divided by the area. Uh, so here's a representation of the force we're applying to this area here. Um, this is the same area in both examples. What differs is the area at the end of the cylinder or the thumbtack here. If you push on a thumbtack, that gives you a gain in force equal to the ratio of this area to that area. And in the thumbtack, this is very small, probably smaller than what we're dealing with in the middle ear itself. Uh, but for the middle ear, that ratio is 0.55 over 0.032, so that's about 17 times greater. Um, that's kind of the gain we get in pressure just by going through that sort of surface area um, conversion. Uh, yeah, so this is what it looks like. This is sort of the, uh, well, this is the eardrum, and this is the oval, well, this footplate of the staves. This is, uh, o, this OW stands for oval window, which is a um, feature of the cochlea itself. Haven't quite gotten to that yet. Uh, but you can kind of see it looks a little bit like, say, this um, area difference or uh, difference in area between uh, with the one end of a thumbtack and the pointy end, or the business end of a thumbtack uh, over here. Yeah, so the middle ear also exerts a lever action on the inner ear. This doesn't have a quite as big of an effect, but it works in a similar way as like a crowbar. Um, so you can kind of think of a crowbar like this, which has a very long handle and then a kind of crook in it, makes a right hand turn, left hand turn. Uh, and then it has kind of a short um, piece here, which you can sort of wrap around like a nail that you might want to remove from a piece of wood or something like that. Um, so the way a crowbar works or the physics behind it is that there is a difference in force that is proportional to the ratio of the handle length to the little end length here. Um, so this is trying to show you that uh, where you get the end result force is the original force you're placing on the handle uh, times the length of this long guy divided by the length of this short guy. Um, so this is similar to what happens with the middle ear. Um, this is a slightly different representation of the incus, but it makes this little jog here, this little left-hand turn um, <laughs> at the very end where it connects up with the stapes. Uh, so that uh, will give you a sort of length difference of about 1.3 apparently, um, which isn't huge, but you can sort of multiply that in with the um, the gain we got through the difference in area here. And then when you sort of multiply them together, you get a difference overall in uh, with, of 20 to 25 dB basically. So the 17 times 1.3 is about 22. So that's in sort of this area. Um, yeah, so that's why the middle ear can amplify sound. It's doing it right now as you're listening to me talk. It does it every single moment of your life, more or less. Uh, and if it doesn't, something's kind of wrong. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but so yeah, as promised, uh, people who have lost their middle ear bones can still hear, uh, but they lose a lot of sensitivity in doing so because they don't get this amplification. Uh, so there is, um, you know, there's, like I said, there's fluid in the inner ear and that can still respond to the sound waves coming in uh, through the middle ear, uh, but they don't respond nearly as well without that extra push from the bones. Um, so that's not great. Uh, there's also another situation where you can kind of lose the benefit of the um, middle ear ossicles. Uh, and that's when, well, yeah, you have to kind of weigh the advantages here. But when you, um, there's kids that keep sneaking around my neighbor's backyard. Anyways, when you hear a loud sound, uh, like a gunshot or a snare drum or something unexpectedly or yeah something loud in general it doesn't have to be immediate it could be an airplane as well or just loud traffic or something like that anything that's louder than say 85 to 90 decibels there's a reflex that reflex that kicks in to attenuate those vibrations of the middle ear uh, and it that happens to help prevent damage to the inner ear because like i said that's also a fragile structure and um, if you get he ear damage or um, damage to your hearing system, you do not get the ability to hear back, it's permanent. Um, so your body kind of wants to try to avoid that. 
Um, and I'll show you how that works with these diagrams. So they're actually tiny little muscles which are connected to these bony structures in your middle ear. Um, we don't have to worry too much about the exact names of them, but that's what they are in case you are curious. Um, and these require 50 to 100 milliseconds of reaction time. So if you are listening to something loud, like, you know, a machine at a factory, which is constantly working or like an airplane when you're on an airplane, so on and so forth, um, it uh, should stand you in good stead. But if there is a very sudden sound like a gunshot, if a bomb explodes next to you, if you are standing too close to a drummer uh, at a rock concert, that sort of thing, um, the uh, sort of loud sounds can get in uh, and sort of cause damage to the ear. Uh, but you can think about this as well, like if you've had a rock concert experience at any time and you've been listening to um, loud music for like hours on end, maybe a drum solo went on way too long. I think we've all been there, right? Um, the uh, What can happen though is that these muscles can fatigue after 15 minutes or so. So uh, yeah, basically if you've been to a... a a rock concert and listen to live music for a long time normally you get the sensation afterwards like you can't really hear anything very well uh, or at least not as well as, you, as you'd like to um, and i think what's going on there is that these muscles are still sort of attenuating sounds as they're coming into your ear and everything just sounds kind of quiet and dead um, however the muscles can fatigue after 15 minutes or so so if these loud sounds keep going you can, can get that damage um, regardless or they will just basically stop working because they're muscles like any other muscles. Um, these muscles are, by the way, also triggered by speaking, which is interesting. Um, and maybe that's just an arbitrary uh, artifact of how they work, or maybe it's to prevent you from being damaged by the sound of your own voice. I don't know. Uh, but this uh, is probably one reason why you sound different to yourself when you hear yourself speaking in real life versus when you hear yourself like um, on a recording of some sort. Uh, because these this inter um, this reaction is not kicking in when you hear yourself speaking uh, in a recording. Um, there's also another difference which um, emerges there too, which uh, is that, as you can see here, the cochlea and the structures of the ear are kind of embedded in this, these other bony structures of your skull. Uh, so when you speak, there's actually vibrations which uh, get transmitted not through the air and outside into your ears like that, uh, but actually just go straight through your head, basically, um, through bone conduction, uh, as it's called. Uh, and you can get those vibrations straight into your cochlea that way. So that's another way that you would sound different to yourself when you're speaking just normally versus when you hear yourself on a recording. Um, but yeah, the main thing to remember here is that the bones of the middle ear amplify sounds as they go into your inner ear, uh, but in order to prevent damage from occurring to your inner ear, these muscles will kick in to prevent these vibrations from, from becoming too violent. Okay, so what happens in the inner ear? This is kind of the most amazing structure of our hearing system. There we find this snail-shaped structure called the cochlea, two out of two. Okay, so it looks like a snail. Um, a little bit and the part the business end here as far as we're concerned is the snail part of it Which is kind of coiled up and in this little loop you can't well that you can't but um, This is showing you kind of what it would look like if you unroll and roll ah, unrolled the spiral or the snail um, shape uh, Kind of looks like I don't know a diver in the Olympics or something kicking out their legs uh, up here these are not the head and arms of the diver, but uh, these are other um, kind of loops in the cochlea, which are oriented in different ways. And they basically um, serve as sort of, uh, well, I want to say gyroscopes, but they're basically there to kind of give you a sense of um, where you are directionally in space. Um, so uh, you get a sense of balance out of these, which I guess is appropriate for talking about diving in the Olympics, I suppose. Um, but that's what this part of the cochlea is for, and it is connected to the hearing part, but uh, they're not uh, really doing the same thing at all. Um, yeah, so uh, I won't say anything further about that, but I will say that the cochlea in general, whether it's these canals or the snail shape at the bottom, is filled with fluid. Um, and it consists of different, different kind of membranes in the interior. 
So before we get there, uh, let's focus briefly on this connection between the ossicles and the uh, cochlea itself. So the stapes or the stirrup dead ends in this structure called the oval window. We saw that briefly before. So it's a little kind of uh, thinner membrane at this particular spot and um, the stapes can kind of push around the fluid uh, through this window. And then at the far end, there's another thinner membrane called the round window, which will kind of bulge out as this fluid gets pushed through um, the entire structure. Uh, this one's called the round window. This one's called the oval window. Um, there's other structures in here which are crucially important to hearing. Uh, and we're going to look at them in this sort of unrolled out, or sorry, rolled out form, just to make it kind of easier to understand. But remember that the whole thing is kind of coiled up like a snail. Um, yeah. So... What we're looking through the middle of the cochlea here. Uh, yeah, we'll go back here briefly. Through the middle of the snail shape is this structure called the basilar membrane. Uh, you can kind of think of this as like membrane on the base of it, even though it's really kind of in the middle. Um, so there are three channels of fluid going through here, and this is the basilar membrane right here in the middle. Um, that is the one that uh, kind of induces all the fun stuff when it comes to hearing, because right on top of it, there are these tiny little hair cells. Uh, so what happens to those hair cells? So again, here's our basilar membrane and the bigger view, here it is in the close up view. So the basilar membrane, because there is fluid kind of being pushed around in these bigger channels here by, so like, the stapes pushes fluid through here and that kind of curls around to the lower channel as well. And that can make this basilar membrane bounce up and down. Um, and on top of this basilar membrane, there are these tiny little hair cells, so-called because they have these little um, kind of spine shaped structures on top of them, which are technically known as cilia or as they're labeled here, stereocilia. Um, so they look like hairs as it were. They function a little bit differently from hair. I don't, yeah, what is the function of hair? I guess keep your head warm um, and other things. Anyways, uh, these cells can bounce up and down so that the cilia or the hairs on top of them will kind of bump up against this other membrane structure called the tectorial membrane. Um, and I'll note here before I show you a close up of that, that there are two different types of hair cells which come into play here. Um, there are the inner hair cells, uh, which are kind of closer to the middle of the cochlea, and then the outer hair cells over here. Um, and the inner hair cells are a little more sensitive to these vibrations than the outer hair cells. They're a little more tightly um, packed with the tectorial membrane. So it's easier to get the inner hair cell hairs to kind of bump up against the tectorial membrane. It takes a little more pressure or effort to get the outer hair cells to kind of make that connection. And you can see, hopefully, that each one of these hair cells is connected to the auditory nerve. So there are nerves connected to these guys, um, which are all bundled together into this auditory nerve, which, I, as I mentioned before, uh, gets connected to the other side of your brain. Um, so if this is your right ear we're talking about, that goes to the left side of your brain. If it's the left ear, it goes to the right side of your brain through this auditory nerve. Um, but the crucial part we need to think about is what connection is being made here exactly. Um, before we get into that, I'll just mention there are about 3,500 of these inner hair cells and about 15,000 to 20,000 of the outer hair cells. There's more of these, um, but these guys wind up being uh, kind of more fundamentally important for hearing. Okay, what happens when these guys bump up against the tectorial membrane? So the basilar mem membrane is being deflected up. It's going to make these guys butt up against this. And then what will happen is that these stereocilia are kind of um, connected at the bottom to these little sort of um, ports or maybe doorways, you could call them, uh, which when they get deflected will open up and the fluid in this part of your cochlea is technically known as endolymph. Uh, but like I said before, it's electrically charged just due to the sort of chemical balance of that fluid. So that electrically charged chemical will go through those open ports in these hair cells. 
and they will change the chemistry briefly of um, the hair cell itself, which is connected to these nerve cells. So these are basically nerve cells. So they will kind of um, fire off uh, a signal of uh, electricity through the auditory, which is connected to the auditory nerve. So that will keep traveling up uh, through your brain. Simply letting the brain know that sort of these passageways have been opened up by the mechanical motion of the basilar membrane. Uh, and that is kind of the spark that gives you a sense of hearing, uh, at least for this particular hair cell in your inner ear. Um, yeah, so the deflection of the hairs opens up the channels in the hair cells, electrically charged endolymph flows into them. Um, and I'm blanking on the term, I think it's action potential. Uh, but the, when the electrically, electrically charged endolymph flows into the hair cells, it sets off that signal, action potential, I believe is what it's called, uh, which is connected through all these various nerve cells through your brain. And then your brain has a sense that something's going on out in the world that it needs to pay attention to, hopefully. Um, okay, those are the fine nitty gritty detail mechanics of how this works. One thing that's interesting about this system from our perspective as phoneticians or just people who are interested in language and hearing in general, uh, is that the cochlea has what is called a tonotopic organization. Uh, so individual hair cells in the cochlea will respond to a range of frequencies, but they're generally kind of tuned to, to respond best to a particular frequency. And the frequencies they respond best to, well, so overall the limits are sort of 20 hertz at the low end. That's the lowest frequency sound you can hear as a human being if your ears are healthy and working properly. And generally speaking, this works better if you're young. Uh, and 20,000 hertz on the high end. Um, I'll show you this in a previous um, part of this lecture, but um, I'm, so I'm 46 at this point. My ears cannot go up to 20,000 hertz anymore. Um, if you're around 20 years old, you're probably good to go. Uh, but how is this organized? So this is called the base of the cochlea. Uh, and this part responds best to high frequencies. And this is a little bit confusing. So I'll give you the terms here and then I'll show you the cochlea in sort of its unrolled form or yeah, unrolled out form. Uh, but the uh, cells at the base are here <coughs> and the apex is here. So the base is what responds to the highest frequencies, uh, like 20,000 or so. The uh, apex cells respond to the lowest frequencies of about 20 Hertz or so on and so forth. Um, and there's a couple of things to note here. So it might help you to think about this in terms of, well, uh, sort of the shorter the distance, the sound wave travels in the cochlea, the uh, higher the frequency, sort of like shorter tubes resonate at a higher frequency. And the longer it has to go, uh, sort of like the longer tube, you're getting a better response for lower frequencies. Um, it's more complicated than that though. So you might notice that I go from, or this diagram goes from 20,000 to 7,000 here. So that's like a big jump just for this large first part of the cochlea. And then it goes from 7,000 to 5,000, 5,000 to 4,000 for almost equally spaced parts. So there's a lot more frequencies or more specific frequencies packed in here at kind of the low frequency end than at the high frequency end. Um, and I'll show you as promised, if we go back, yeah, so this is the base. It's the part that's closest to the oval window or the round window for that matter. So the vibrations are coming in here and these are the parts that are gonna respond uh, best to the highest frequency, uh, highest frequencies. And then these are the parts of the cochlea that will respond best to the lowest frequencies. So again, those um, are normally wrapped up in this coil shape. Uh, so this is where you're getting the low frequency response in your cochlea. The high frequency response will be out here uh, toward the end of the coiled circles. Okay, um, the last thing I'll mention about this is this technical term I use to describe it. This is called the tonotopic organization of the cochlea. So tono here just means tone or pitch or frequency uh, and topic just means place. So this means that particular places are dedicated to particular tones or pitches. Um, and in our next little segment of this lecture, we'll try to get a sense of how that works exactly. 
uh, but keep in mind that what you get out of this is that as you hear sound, your ear is going to kind of uh, perform an implicit Fourier analysis on those sounds. It's going to create a spectrogram-like representation of them because some of these hair cells will be responding better to particular frequencies like where we might find, say, F1 uh, for a vowel. Others might be responding better to where we might find, say, the uh, um, noise of S way up here at the high end, so on and so forth. But it breaks it down in a similar fashion, not exactly the same as the way we break sound down using um, a spectrogram and prop. So isn't that cool? Uh, took human beings consciously until like World War II to figure out how to make a spectrograph, but our bodies had solved the problem well before that. Okay, uh, we'll try to walk through how this works in our next section, so I'll see you guys then.